as we come to this passage of Scripture, you might have noticed that it mentions many different things. But what this psalm does speak of, it speaks of darkness throughout the passage. This psalm speaks of living in the depths of life. This psalm speaks of imminence of death. That death is coming, and it's coming to all of us. This psalm speaks of feelings of drowning or depression, in a sense. This psalm speaks of loneliness and imprisonment. Throughout this psalm, we find it is one of the saddest psalms in the Psalter. All 150 psalms, when you look at all of them and compare them, you find sometimes a depressing psalmist receives a, an encouraging word from God. But from verses 1 all the way through 18, you find the psalmist pouring out his heart before God and God not answering or replying in return. As I was meditating here in this text, I, I couldn't help but think of this as, as I read how verse 1 talks about the psalmist crying day and night before God. How it says in verse number 3, For my soul or his life is full of troubles and his life draws nigh to the grave. And without a response from God, I wrote down this. It's okay to not know why. It's okay to not know why. I know that as we come to a passage like this, we see a psalmist who's in deep despair. We say, why, God, would you allow this person to go through this despair? Why, God, would you allow this destruction or this time of, of tragedy to impact this individual? We have all these questions, but it's okay not to have any answers at this moment. It's okay to, 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 to not know why throughout life or throughout a season of life. I want you to take note of the superscription found in the psalm. It says, a, right before verse 1, it says, A song or psalm for the sons of Korah. This is the last psalm that is devoted to the sons of Korah throughout the Psalter, throughout the book of Psalms. It says to the chief musician, Mahaloth Lianoth, Mashkil of Heman, the Ezraite. The word or the name Heman is the one who wrote the psalm. Now, there's a couple options for us. Option number one, one choice is Heman, the son of Mahal, one of the wise men during the reign of King Solomon. If you do have your Bibles, you might want to turn over to 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse number 31. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 31. It's always interesting to try to discover who wrote the passage of Scripture when we're studying the Word of God. But we find in 1 Kings chapter 1, we find that Solomon is being declared amongst all the land about his wisdom. And in verse 30, the Bible says, And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. Verse 31 says, For he was wiser than all men. Then Ethan the Ezraite, which, by the way, Psalm 89, perhaps is speaking of this one who wrote Psalm 89, the next psalm. And then it says, And Heman, and Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all nations round about. So here in this verse, when Solomon was alive and his wisdom was being spread, there's a guy named Heman. And this is a possible candidate for writing this psalm. But I want to share with you, I do not believe that candidate is the proper one to come to a conclusion who wrote this psalm. Because this man is known as being a wise man, not a musician. Perhaps he was a musician, but the Bible is totally silent on that issue. There's another Haman, Haman found in 1 Chronicles. And if you do have your Bibles, um, uh, take them over to 1 Chronicles chapter 6 and verses 33 and verse 37. We find a, a I believe... A 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 33 and 37. I believe that this gives us an idea and unlocks the key to discovering who wrote this psalm. So 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 33. And by the way, this is during a time period of verse 31 speaks about how these are they whom David set over the service of song in the house of the Lord after the ark 
had rest. So they brought the ark in and they began to, to delegate individuals to come and play music and praise before God. And verse 32 says that they ministered before the dwelling place of the tabernacle. The congregation was singing. It says, um, unto Solomon had built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem and then they waited on their office according to their order. And verse 33 says, and these are they that waited with their children. Of the sons of the Kohathites, Heman, a singer, the son of Joel. This individual, I believe, is the one referring to in the superscription of Psalm 88. Excuse me. And then if you got your Bibles there, turn over to verse 37. Mentions uh, just a continuation. This is a genealogical record and just goes and continues on throughout the chapter. But ver chapter 15 of 1 Chronicles and verse 17 also lets us in a little, a little extra side note. But it says these words, So the Levites appointed Heman the son of Joel. So we find that, that this guy is a man who's involved in the Old Testament, involved in the music during these time period. And it says, verse 16, And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music, psalteries and harps and cymbals, sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So with these thoughts in mind, as we come to the name Heman in Psalm 88, it seems very logical to conclude that this is the one who wrote the psalm because he was a singer. And we know that the psalms are songs that were sung throughout the children of Israel's time period. Now, with that in mind, I want to say this. That whether this was the hymn found in the days of Solomon or in the days of David, depending on which one, it really doesn't matter. Okay? Push come to shove. But what does matter is the fact that this psalmist was going through a very, very tough time. And it appears that he's asking the why question. But may I remind you, it's okay not to know why. Now, with these thoughts in mind, I want to share this with you. Somebody said this psalm, Psalm 88, is the darkest, most mournful psalm in the Psalter. Psalter is a term referring to the entire book of Psalms, Psalm 1 all the way through Psalm 50. Another commentator said, This psalm is unique in the fact that it is only the only psalm in which the outpouring of the burdened heart of the psalmist to God fails to bring relief or consolation. So I know there's been times in your life that you're sitting here this evening and you've been burdened down with, the, with all the baggage life carries and you're saying, God, why haven't you responded to my prayer? Well, I'm glad that I can be an encouragement to let you know that Heman in the Old Testament was going through a very similar situation and he poured out his heart to God and God didn't respond right away. In a day that, that uh, the microwave isn't fast for us. In a day that, that McDonald's drive through is not fast enough for us. In a day in which all these fast things that we have is not fast enough for us. We need to understand that sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers right away. Now, I would like to give you a key statement that's going to summarize this psalm, and it's going to summarize this content of this sermon. When we don't know why, be persistent in prayer, stay hopeful, and never abandon faith. When we don't know why, be persistent in prayer, stay hopeful, and never abandon faith. You see, this psalm reveals a man who's asking why, he's pouring out his heart before God, and God is not responding. But you know what we do not see of him in? We do not see him in running away from God and throwing God's word to the side and just neglecting the will of God. Far too many Christians, when God doesn't respond to them right away, they run away. Perhaps those who run away were never saved to begin with. Remember what 1 John says? It says, if they were truly of us, they would have continued with us. Now, with all these thoughts in mind, I believe this psalm, these 18 verses, reveals to us specific instructions on how 
we, or excuse me, four instructions we can follow when we don't know why. In verses 1 and 2, I wrote down this. When we don't know why, go to God in faith. In verses 3 through 9, I wrote down this. When we don't know why, tell God how we feel. In verses 10 through 14, I wrote down this. When we don't know why, defend our cause before God. And then verses 15 through 18, I wrote down this. When we don't know why, wait for God to answer. Will you come with me as we journey through this passage? Uh, verses 1 through 2 teach us, When we don't know why, go to God in faith. When we don't know why, go to God in faith. Now, may I say this today? A generation has been raised within the United States of America who are totally faithless. They don't rely on faith. They need hard, substantial evidence. In fact, um, there, there's a friend, of, a friend of mine that some of you are, are, are acquainted with. But nonetheless, um, I sent him a private message over Facebook because he was posting uh, some funny memes about religious and, and uh, about religion and all these different things. So I sent him a message and said, hey, man, I, I, I think your memes are funny. It's, memes are just pictures that are like a joke that you would read in the comic section of the newspapers just online. So nonetheless, he has these pictures on Facebook and social media. And I sent him a message and said, hey, man. These pictures are hysterical. I think they're hilarious. And by the way, I've read many of Charles um, uh, Dawkins' books. He's a, a, a very popular atheist and scientist. And I said, I find his writings very, very interesting. But I'm just curious to know why you have chosen to be an atheist. So I just sent out an invitation saying, hey, I'd be glad to meet with you and extend a conversation about this just to see where you are. And then he began to make a long post on Facebook. Some of you might have seen it. And he began to list his reasons why he was an atheist. And you know what his reason was? Basically, his reason was there's a lack of evidence in the existence of God. So in other words... He did not want to have faith. But may I say this today, that sometimes in life, when somebody goes through a tragedy, they encounter this term faith, and they're not willing to hold on to it. What we need now more than ever, in a generation that's been raised on humanism and secularism and atheism and all the other isms out there, that are not related to Biblicism, what we need to do here at our church is to instill the importance of our young people, of our children, and our adult people of relying on God in faith. You see, we could have an intellectual conversation and I could give you evidence after evidence that I believe is evidence for the existence of God and the Word of God. But you know, all it boils down to is somebody doesn't want to realize that they're a sinner before a righteous God and they need to bow down and trust Him in faith. And today, the Bible says here in verse number 1 and 2, O oh Lord God of my salvation. As you know, throughout the psalm, salvation just means deliverance. Here it could be possibly just speaking of, of an eternal deliverance, but more than likely is speaking of a temporal deliverance. And he says, O oh Lord God of my salvation, of my deliverance, you're the one who's going to deliver me. He says, I've cried day and night before thee. So in other words, he says, God, I've been praying to you constantly. It's not that he's weeping before God and crying like a baby as we say but he's just pouring out his heart to God and he says let my prayer come before thee incline thine ear unto my cry when we don't know why go to God in faith but may I share with you from verses 3 through 9 as I was meditating in these several verses I wrote down this when we don't know why tell God how we feel when we don't know why, tell God how we feel. While I was in Bible college, I had an instructor. In fact, he was my Baptist history and distinctives instructor. 
and in this course we learned about Baptist history um, and we also learned the distinctives of being a Baptist that Brother Bill's been putting in the bulletin and a very good um, job by the way Brother Bill but nonetheless uh, in this class the instructor would stand up there and say communication solves all problems but what's interesting is, is when you would try to communicate with this instructor, he was the worst at practicing what he was declaring from the podium in class. But what I learned from that is no matter if it's in a marriage, no matter if it's in um, a church, no matter if it's in a family, no matter what, if it's in a business or whatever it is, communication is the only way to solve problems. There's been times in my life where somebody was mad at me and I've tried to reach out to them and they were unwilling to communicate. Well, you can't solve issues if somebody's not willing to communicate. And I know there's probably been times where uh, I've been mad at somebody on the other side of the spectrum and I refused to communicate with them. We're all guilty of this. But I'm here to tell you something. We're very guilty of doing it before God. Sometimes something happens in our lives and we're, we, we shun God from our own lives. But in verses 3 through 9, we find that the psalmist, Heman, is being very honest before a holy, righteous God. And he's telling God how he feels. He says, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws nigh to the grave. He says, God, my life is totally reckless and I feel like I just might as well die. And he says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. The pit here, sometimes it's referring to a dungeon or a place that they would store prisoners or all these different things. Kind of like a place they threw Jesus in or a place that Joseph got thrown into um, when he was uh, during the Old Testament and so it goes on to say, Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. We all read this, and we all can think of maybe some times in our own lives where we feel very at home with these words. Verse 7 says, Thy wrath lies hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy ways. I don't know if you've ever been to the ocean, but sometimes the ocean has some very, very large waves. And sometimes you see these gnarly guys out there surfing on these waves and doing all these different things. But let me tell you something, when that wave hits you in the face, it's going to hurt. And sometimes the, the, the waves of life hit us, and man, they hurt. And the psalmist here is saying, oh, wow, God, you're allowing all these waves to hit me. Why, 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 why? He goes on to say, thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourns by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Listen, communication solves all problems. It does. And the only way your burdens will ever get lifted is if you cast that burden on the Lord. When we don't know why, tell God how you feel. When we don't know why, go to God in faith. But may I share with you in verses 10 through 14, we discover this third instruction of how, uh, instruction to follow when we don't know why. When we don't know why, defend your calls before God. When we don't know why, defend your calls before God. Verses 10 through 14, we find the psalmist begins to ask question after question after question to God. Now, I'm reminded, uh, when I read verses 10 through 14, I'm reminded of the book of Job. When Job is, you know, going through his troubles and his life, and God begins to speak to him. And God is asking questions to Job without any interest of Job responding. You can read it through the latter portions of the book of Job. And, and God says, where were you at the foundations of the world when the morning stars uh, shouted for joy? And, and the question after question after question and question, and Job doesn't respond, and he doesn't respond to each question. And here we find a reverse situation. Man, a man, is asking God questions without God giving answers. And it says, wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? Or thy faithfulness and destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark? Thy righteousness in the land of, of, the, of forgetfulness? 
And look at verse 13. But unto thee have I cried. He said that in verse 1. He said it in verse 9. And he says it again in verse 13. Unto thee have I cried, O Lord. In the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. He goes on, verse 14. Lord, why castest thou off from my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? So here, the psalmist is saying, God, why are you doing this? Why, 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 why? Well, may I remind us all this evening, it's okay not to know why. It's okay to not know why. When we don't know why, be persistent in prayer. Stay hopeful and never abandon faith. Verses 1 through 2, we discovered when we don't know why, go to God in faith. Verses 3 through 9, we received an instruction when we don't know why, tell God how you feel. And then in verses 10 through 14, we discover this instruction when we don't know why, defend your cause before God. But now may I share with you verses 15 through 18, probably the most important aspect of this psalm and this sermon. When we don't know why, Wait for God to answer. When we don't know why, wait for God to answer. There's a word that we choose that, that modern Christianity seems to neglect and doesn't pray for and doesn't ask for and doesn't seek to have. And that's patience. Modern Christianity is so impatient that we forgot it's important to be patient in waiting on God to reply to our prayers. As you look out throughout the world today, you have spouses who are impatient towards their spouse. You have children who are impatient towards their parents. You have parents who are impatient with their children. You have employers who are impatient with their employees. You have employees who are impatient with their employers. You have teachers who are impatient with their students. You have students who are impatient with their teachers. And you have the teachers and the students impatient with their principal. And you have the principal who's impatient with their teachers and their students. Everywhere you go, everybody is impatient one to another. And as you begin to scratch the surface and dig a little bit deeper, you find that the people of God are impatient with God. The Bible says that God is long-suffering. He is patient. And it says here in verse 15, I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goes over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. Verse 17, they come around me, uh, excuse me, they come uh, around about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance into darkness. May I remind us all, when we don't know why, Wait for God to answer. <coughs> you say, this is such a psalm that's not full of hope. It's so full of darkness. It's so full of despair. It's so full of the deeps and the depths of life. But may I share with you, <coughs> this is one of the most hopeful psalms, I believe, throughout the Scriptures. Because it reveals to us that when somebody was going through a terrible, hard time in life, <coughs> They didn't give up. They kept persistent in prayer. They stayed hopeful. And they never abandoned faith. Church, as I look out in this auditorium and as I'm reminded of some of the ones who are not here this evening, that yes, hard times have hit us all. And hard times is no respecter of persons. And if you live long enough... And if you live life in the slow lane or the fast lane, sometimes the hard times are going to come. <coughs> but it's okay to not know why. When we don't know why, wait for God to answer. When we don't know why, defend your cause before God. When you don't know why, tell God how you feel. And when we don't know why, go to God in faith. I close with this statement. When we don't know why, be persistent in prayer. Stay hopeful and never abandon faith.